Hi, I'm Selena from Annie's Bookstop of Worcester, and I'm here with Adib Koran, who is a, <laughs> he is a, um, well, he's a children's book author. He's a uh, LGBT romance author, a young adult. Um, he's done a lot of different things. So for readers unfamiliar with your work, uh, how would you describe what you write? I write books that tend to uh, center and explore uh, Iranian diaspora experiences and often queer Iranian diaspora experiences. And I think I try to write for readers of all ages and, and meet them where they are, whether that's uh, writing for young kids about holidays or making friends or writing for teenagers about the travails of being a teenager, which I don't know if any of your uh, viewers know or remember this, but being a teenager is rough. Uh, especially going through high school. Uh, and when I write for adults, I write about um, adult concerns like jobs and love and friendship and sometimes wine or French fries. Mm -hmm. Okay. So what can readers expect from your latest book? Uh, so my latest book, I'm going to, I'm going to do a little, a little presentation. Uh, Bijan Always Wins uh, is a picture book. So for young kids, uh, about a young boy, an Iranian boy named Bijan, who makes everything into his life into a competition to be won, even things that cannot be won, like eating your vegetables or tying your shoes or falling asleep. But naturally, his friends start to get pretty annoyed with him, making everything into a competition, and uh, he has to learn how to correct course, uh, make some apologies, and realize that friendship is more important than winning. Wonderful. So what do you think draws readers to these kinds of books? I think, uh, you know, especially for young kids, uh, so much of what draws them to books will be the art. And it's illustrated, my, Bijan is illustrated by the amazing Michelle Tran. Uh, it's it's soft and it's whimsical and it's fun and it's colorful. And I think young readers will be drawn to that. I think uh, adults who are going to be reading the books to their kids, since uh, you know, many kids don't always get to 100% select their own reading choices, uh, especially when they're, you know, two or three years old. Um, I think adults are going to be attracted to a story about uh, a child that wants to win at everything because I feel like just about everyone either knows someone like that or has been someone like that at various points in their life. Um, I think it's also like it's a very funny book, I think. Bijan is a delightful but occasionally ridiculous character. And the situations he gets into, I think, will uh, make young readers laugh quite a bit. Okay. Now, what was the inspiration for, for that book, for Bijan Always Wins? It's so weird. Um, anytime anyone asks me about inspiration for any book, because the timeline between like when I start, when I get inspired and write the book and when the book actually comes out can sometimes be several years. Um, I think the inspiration for this was me really thinking about like being a child myself and uh and where the line was between fun and games and then like turning those games into something that needed to be won and uh sort of the pressure that i feel like a lot of kids get from adults in their lives to win at things and to place an emphasis on victory over fun and connection with others uh and so i think i was thinking about that uh but also i feel like that's you know very kind of big blue sky dreamy inspirations. Um, also, I kind of wanted to write a book that was funny. Uh, my first picture book was about uh, the Iranian holiday of Noruz, which is a celebration of uh, the new year every spring. Um, and most of the readers uh, responded m not to like the holiday, but to the cat that was in every single page getting into mischief. And I was like, you know what? When I was a kid, I also liked books that made me laugh. So I kind of wanted to dig a little deeper into laughing. And I think, or at least hope, um, kids are are savvy enough to look at the book and be like, you can't win at vegetables. Uh, and sort of things escalate uh, in ridiculousness. And I hope that makes kids laugh. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would think it would. <laughs> okay. Did you have to do any research for that book? Oh. I don't, I don't know that I did have to do any research for this one. Um, Aside from like reading lots of picture books, like I try to stay current with what's popular in picture books, what kids are enjoying in picture books, uh, what teachers and librarians and parents are liking and sharing with their kids. 
Uh, so in that sense, I was reading, I guess you could call that research. But like, did I research if you can win at vegetables? No, like I already knew that you can't, you just can't win at vegetables. Right. Okay. And uh, what is your favorite research story? My favorite research story, ooh, probably came from uh, back when I was working on my first uh, young adult novel, Darius the Great is Not Okay, uh, which is about uh, a boy named Darius who goes to Iran to visit his family there for the first time. And uh, I got on Google Street View to see like what the, the city in Iran where he was visiting, which is called Yazd, what it looks like today, because uh, that's where my family is from, but they haven't been there in, you know, 20, 30, 40, 50 years, except for the ones who still live there. Um, and uh, as I was researching, uh, my dad was over for dinner and was like, what are you looking at? And I showed him and he like just plopped down next to me, and just like watched like this as I was like clicking through the streets. And he's like, that didn't used to be there. That didn't used to be there. Oh, that's still there. I remember that I did such and such there. And it was really uh, funny to watch him like relive his youth vicariously through me doing research for a book. Wow, that must have been fabulous. It was, you know, it was just really fun. <laughs> wow. So did you get some uh, anecdotes from him? Um, I did. I had for, uh, for the book. Oh yeah, I had lots of uh, stories. Uh, I had lots of old family photos, but so many of them were, you know, from before my family emigrated, and so uh, it was really interesting to see like what was still the same and what had changed in the intervening years. Uh, but yeah, it was. There's a lot of kind of family lore that had the serial numbers filed off and then put into the book. Oh, wow. Okay. Um, so what was the biggest challenge that you had in writing and, well, putting out Bijan Always Wins? I think the biggest challenge is always that um, writing for children is hard. I think there are lots of uh, people out there that, think the opposite that think that writing for children is easy uh that picture books mm -hmm. or that you know children's books don't need a lot of thought um but children are and I know this is going to shock some people but children are people they are human beings with their own thoughts and feelings and desires and senses of humor and it can be really challenging as an adult to put yourself in the mindset of how do I meet kids where they are? How do I not talk down to them on any subject? How do I connect with them uh, at their level? And I think that's a challenge with every picture book. And especially uh, with this one, my first picture book was about a holiday. And so in a way, like, so it was just like, this is what the holiday is. And this is, you know, the kind of things we do for a holiday. And that was, um, you know, its own set of challenges. But trying to like write a complete story with a beginning, middle and end, uh, that you know, a five-year-old could empathize with, could see themselves in the main character or see their friend in the main character um, was really challenging because you know, I'm not five years old anymore. I have to draw on the five-year-olds in my life. I have to draw on my own memories, dim though they may be. I have to draw on you know what, what teachers and psychologists and parents have to say about what it's like. Um, and at a certain point, I also have to make a leap of faith that, you know, they are still people and they are still human and that I as a human can connect with them and tell them a story that will make them smile. Mm hmm. Okay. So we, you had just said something about, um, about the children. Again, it, what is it that made you write for children? Uh, I started out, I think, well, my first published book was for teens. Um, the first the books that I wrote before that that did not sell because they were terrible were all for teens. I think the very, very first book I tried to write was like an adult fantasy. Um, but I think I learned early on that adults are kind of boring um, and children are much more interesting. And in particular, I started taking my writing seriously around like 2012, 2013, uh, 2014, when young adult fiction was probably the most exciting place to be in writing because the stories were uh, immersive and different and emotional and exciting. And, you know, in the same year that like the Hunger Games uh, came out, I feel like I also read a bunch of like adult literary novels and I could swear I read three different ones that were all by three different authors, but that were all about 
like a 40 year old white man getting celiac and then getting divorced. Like that was the entirety of the novel. And like, like I know celiac is very serious. I don't know what I would do if I couldn't have pasta. And I know divorce is a traumatic thing for families, for individuals. Um, even so, like three books that were all about the same thing. I was like, God, adults are boring. <laughs> like I'm gonna go and write for young people because they're interesting and their books are interesting. And I found that my narrative voice worked really well for young adult fiction. And I found that the stories I wanted to tell were stories that made a lot of sense as young adult books. So that's, I think, how I got my start. And having been there uh, and having so many you know, teenagers uh, talk about like how excited they were, for instance, Iranian teenagers to say how excited they were to see an Iranian character in a book. I was like, okay, well, I'm helping the teenagers see themselves in books. There aren't a whole lot of other Iranians writing picture books. Uh, so maybe I should try that as well. Uh, and uh, it ended up working out pretty well, I think. Uh -huh. So I, I think that your books, even though it is an Iranian character or whatever, is certainly, um, certainly applicable to any child. Uh, as well i think yeah i mean we always we always hope young people are going to develop empathy from reading books um we hope that they will learn and grow that way um but also like it is written for iranians like i was thinking of people like me when i wrote it and while anyone can read it that doesn't change like who it's for if that makes sense ah okay Okay. Yeah, that does make sense. It's very interesting. Okay. Um, so was there one character in uh, Bijan Always Wins that you really loved or hated the most? Oh, um, I mean, I just loved writing about Bijan. He uh, has so much of my childhood self in him, even though I don't think I was quite as obsessed with winning as he is. Uh, he's very imaginative and um, sometimes lost in his own mind. And I was definitely like that as a kid. Like I was a very, I wouldn't say introverted kid, but I definitely like had my own life that was going on and other people were lucky to be living in it. Uh, and they were side characters. Um, and I think that's true of a lot of, uh, a lot of us when we're that age. And I just had so much fun with him. Hmm, okay. And um, so, when you write your books, do you have an outline or are you a pantser? I very much prefer to write from the seat of my pants. Okay. Uh, I do sometimes use outlines. Uh, sometimes it's a requirement of like my publisher that like I submit an outline before I write the book that they want to buy. Sometimes it's that I can't hold the story in my head without an outline to refer to. Um, or sometimes it's a really complicated book that I like need an outline. But left to my own devices, I definitely prefer to not have an outline because I think of all the books I have had outlines for, I think only one of them turned out how the outline was. Uh, all the others, like I went off the out, like I deviated from the outline early on anyway. Um, so yeah, I think the more books I write, the more I realize that I have to write every book differently. And that it's almost like I'm I'm learning how to write all over again with every single book, and so maybe they'll maybe I'll work on another book where I'm like, oh, I think I need an outline. Um, but for now, I feel really good about pantsing. What's your favorite point of view to write in? Oh, wait, did you say to read in or to write in? To write in. I don't know that I have a favorite. Um, I feel like it. Every story needs something a little different. And I, mm -hmm. I, I love finding the right one for a story, um, whether that be first person or third person, whether it be present or past. Um, I think that moment when it clicks is a really exciting moment. Mm -hmm. You know you've picked the right one. But I don't know, I don't know that I could put a favorite on it. I mean, I spent, I spent most of my life uh, telling myself I hated books in the second person and would never ever think about writing one. And I just sent one into my agent that was written, written in the second person. Uh, so I think 
A, never say never. And B, like <laughs> our tastes are always constantly changing. And I'm actually, I just finished reading a book in the second person that I loved to death. It was called Kindling by Tracy Chi. And it was just masterfully done. Okay. So how do you find the point of view? I mean. Uh, I think part of, part of being a pantser for me is a certain amount of like trust in my subconscious. And so a lot of times I just sit down and whatever comes out of me is the POV that I try first. And I would say almost every time my subconscious has guided me correctly, whether it was, uh, you know, past or present, whether it was first or third or now second. Um, I don't actually sit down to write until like the book starts writing itself in my head. Like I can start mm -hmm. to like hear myself writing it. And, and I think that kind of initial flash is a very uh, subconsciously driven, like I'm not actively trying to do it. And so I do have to follow, I don't know, I'm hesitant to call it my muse, but sometimes it does feel like that. Like, you know, we're never quite sure where it's coming from, but we're sure glad it's there. And then we're really annoyed when it's not because we have deadlines to meet and bills to pay. And the characters, do the characters actually kind of push you in, in a certain direction? Sometimes, yes. Sometimes I definitely feel like I have both hands on the wheel. There have been times uh, where I have felt like a character has grabbed the wheel and zigged the car um, or zagged it, zigzagged it, <laughs> whatever, serpentine pattern. Um, so yeah, it does happen sometimes. And I always thought that was something that other people made up uh, until it happened to me. And I was like, oh, sometimes yeah. you do just have to follow the story and follow the characters <laughs> where they want to go, even though you didn't plan for it. Okay. So what can we expect from you in the near future? Uh, in the near future, uh, I have my very first adult romance coming out. Uh, it's called I'll Have What He's Having. Uh, it comes out August 27th. Uh, it's set in Kansas City, Missouri, and is a uh, mistaken identity, friends with benefits to lovers romance about uh, Farzan, who inherits his parents' Iranian restaurant, even though he doesn't know how to run a restaurant and David, uh, a black man studying for his master sommelier's test. And they agree to share knowledge and share study, like be study buddies. And they promise each other they definitely won't fall in love. And of course, it being a romance novel, they very much do fall in love. And it's full of lots of Persian food and just good food in general, and lots of wine and lots of Kansas City. Any recipes? Uh, there are no recipes, because uh, I, I wouldn't say I guard my family recipes like jealously. But like, I definitely don't want to just like be giving out my aunt's recipe to everyone. Like she gave it to uh, me, so I have to choose. Like I, I do give her recipes to other people, but like, I don't give them to strangers. Like I give them to my friends. <laughs> okay. Cause I don't want someone making my recipe badly and then being like, oh, don't make the recipes in a Deeves book. Um, like, <laughs> okay, it's not my fault if you don't know how to brown chicken. Like, anyway, it's too, it's too much pressure. So I, when is that coming out again? It comes out August 27th. Okay. Uh, are you working on anything else? Uh, yeah, actually, um, the the second, uh, it's a trio of romances. Uh, it's about, you know, Farzan is one of three best friends. They're all Iranian American and they're all gay and they're all nearing 40 and finding love. And so the second one in that trio uh, is what I'm working on right now. And that'll come out in fall of 2025. Wonderful. And I also... Uh, I have a, another picture book coming out, I think, in 2025, but maybe 2026, um, depending on art and printing. And I don't always know. I, I The book comes out when they tell me it's going to come out. Um, but it's called Tea is Love. Uh, and it's illustrated by um, Hannah Cha. And uh, it's just about tea. And, uh, and I should be, I saw the pencils for it a while back. And I think I should be seeing final art pretty soon. Uh, which is really exciting because I love drinking tea and I loved writing a book about tea. So do you have much contact at all, if any, with the artist? Not usually. Usually I talk to my editor. My editor talks to the art director and the art director talks with the illustrator. Occasionally we will. I mean, I have talked to all my illustrators, but almost always it's been about like life and fun things and sharing jokes, uh, not about like the book. I think I... I have a lot of respect and a little bit of like fear of illustrators um, <laughs> because it's something that like, I just, I don't speak that language and I, 
I'm not good at visual art. And I don't, I don't want to be the kind of author that they feel like they don't want to work with because I'm like too nosy or like giving too many opinions. Uh, like, I don't want them to tell me how to write the book and I don't want to tell them how to illustrate the book. But certainly friendly, like sharing memes, sharing like tea recommendations or restaurant recommendations. Yes, absolutely. We'll, <laughs> we'll communicate about that all the time. Okay, <laughs> great. So now I have questions about being a writer. What's your favorite part of being a writer on the whole writing and publishing process? Um, my my kind of jokey but also true answer is that my favorite part is whatever part I'm not actively doing right now. So I always <laughs> feel like whatever part I'm working on now is like the hardest thing I've ever done and it's the worst and I wish I didn't have to do it. Um, but I think more seriously, I love uh, talking to readers. I love meeting them. I love visiting schools and libraries. Uh, and I love the moment of connection when someone has read uh, a book you wrote and and seen part of themselves in it. And I think that's really magical. I think that's kind of the whole point of art in a way is to find ways of connecting with other people. Okay. And what do you consider the most challenging part of the writing process? Oh, I mean, A, whatever part I'm currently doing. Um, I think... This may be too esoteric, but I think like the emotions of having a career in publishing can be really challenging at times um, because, you know, you're by yourself and you're thinking, oh, I'm writing a book, I'm an artist. Um, but then you're publishing your book, which is a capitalist enterprise, and uh, you can think it's beautiful and it's the best book ever written, but that doesn't necessarily mean people are going to buy it or think it's the best thing ever written. And... Mm -hmm. Like it can really mess with your head in lots of ways to be putting your art out into the world for consumption. Uh, you can see uh, your peers uh, or occasionally your enemies um, doing better, uh, you know, have, selling more books than you're selling. And you're like, well, why do they get something that I don't have? Um, and I think, yeah, it can really mess with your head. And I think that's really challenging. And I'm really fortunate in that uh, before I was a writer, I already had like 10 years in a completely different career. Uh, I had a, like a well-established friend group, none of whom are authors. And I think having a grounding in life and a good sense of self have really helped me navigate that and like not give in to some of the more toxic impulses that some people in this industry sometimes give into <laughs> if they don't have good friends to be like, hey, maybe you don't need to share that thought online. Like maybe... You complain to your friends about that over tacos instead of going on Instagram and posting 20 stories about someone how, about how someone has done you wrong or how about, about how you hated such and such book. Yeah. I don't know. Sorry, that was a really long winding answer. No, that's good. <laughs> sometimes, yeah, knowing how to behave in public, knowing how to behave professionally uh, is a big challenge for a lot of people. Mm, very true. Very true. So what's been your favorite adventure? during your writing career? My favorite adventure was back in 2022. I uh, I spent most of my life loving pasta and loving Italian food in general. And so in 2021, I said I was tired of waiting for the right time and I was just going to take a trip to Italy. Uh, so in 2022, I did go to Italy. I was there for eight weeks. I, I stayed in Milan. Uh, like that. I had a little uh, Airbnb in Milan and... On the weekends, I took the train to other cities. And on the weekdays, I wrote a book. Uh, oh. So um, that book will hopefully come out in 2025. And that was like the best thing ever to just wake up and, you know, look out over the city of Milan or uh, be on a train through the Italian countryside and then just be writing a book also set in Italy uh, and also eating pasta every single day. It was glorious. <laughs> Really good pasta, I would assume. It was really, really good. <laughs> Even the pasta I made for myself was quite good. You made your own pasta when you were there? Oh, yeah. Um, occasionally, like the from scratch eggs, but most of the time, you know, I would go to the Italian grocery store and get the Italian pasta from the grocery store and then bring it back to my apartment. And, you know, as with any Airbnb, it's like a mix of nice pots and like someone should have thrown this away 10 years ago pots. Um, but I made it work. And and ate pretty well every single day. Oh, that's great. 
<laughs> so what's the greatest lesson that you've learned thus far in your writing career? Oh, that's a really hard one. I think the greatest lesson I have learned uh, has been to resist the urge, the impulse that I I have, and I think a lot of people sometimes have, uh, to wall off your heart, to reach a reach a point in your life and and or your career and say no new friends. Um, my greatest lesson has been uh, to not give in to that impulse, to still meet new people, to still make new friends, to still uh, reach out for others and let them reach out for me and not wall myself off. I think that has been difficult at times, um, but it has served me well to learn that and to keep learning it over and over. Hmm. Do you find as an author that uh, more and more people want to make friends with you? It's weird because uh, when you're an author, some people want to make friends with you and some people want something from you. And ah. it's not always easy to tell the difference. Um, and I think maybe that's why it becomes really easy to close yourself off. Um, but yeah, there, I think, you know, writing is a lonely profession. Um, and so most of us do crave human connections. And um, also like when someone writes a book you really like, when someone makes a piece of art you really like, it feels like you know them and it can be weird in a way because you do know part of them, but you don't know all of them. And it can be really weird to just be like, oh, I loved your book. Let us now be best friends. Um, but also like sometimes that literally has happened. Like I read someone's book and I was like, I loved your book. And they're like, hey, thanks. I like your books too. And then we did like just become friends. Um, so I think, you know, you can't, you can't shut yourself off from the opportunities to make good, genuine friendships just because not everyone out there is genuine. Well, the author community is just so tight knit. Um, it's it's a little different than just having a fan come up to you and say, "I want to be your best friend," because oh, yeah. you have something in common there, and and you 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 all have the same um, the same kind of uh, issues, I guess is the word. That's true, and I think, I mean, I certainly don't think I can see myself being friends with any fans, especially writing for young people. Like, I think it's really important and healthy to have boundaries in place with your readers. Um, but certainly, yeah, with other authors, uh, at, the end of the, at the end of the day, all of us have had that experience of like, go to a bookstore and then no one showed up for a signing. And oh yeah, <laughs> all of us have had that experience of like, go to a festival and then like the books didn't actually show up. And so now you're just sitting there with no books to sell. Um, we've all we've all had certain nightmare scenario a little bit like how everyone on earth has like had a nightmare with their when their teeth fell out or a nightmare when they showed up to work naked like it's just a universal experience <laughs> and yeah like at the end of the day we've all we've all seen some stuff <laughs> right that's true all right um so what piece of advice would you want to give to other writers i think the one I guess I'm gonna I'm gonna cheat and give two pieces of advice. Oh, and that's great. Particularly for any new writer, uh, my advice is always to don't to not take other people's advice, <laughs> um, because there's a million people out there who are offering advice, and at the end of the day, every person is different and every writer is different, and what works for one person or a hundred other people might not work for you, uh, and it, having a rigid outlook that there's only one way to be a writer can only hinder your writing process. So ignore advice or try lots of uh, try lots of things and see what feels right. See what helps you rather than holds you back. Uh, and, you know, keep those pieces and throw out all the rest. And then my second piece of advice for anyone who's a writer uh, or really anyone in an artistic field in general is to not conflate your sense of self-worth with your work. Um, because I think I've been in this long enough and there's a lot of people out there uh, with holes in their hearts that they think will be filled by success at writing books. And my experience has been those kinds of holes in our hearts are only filled by loving ourselves uh, as, as imperfect human beings and not by like things we can accomplish. Because 
generally speaking, when people accomplish something or get something, they tend to want more of it. Uh, and 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 loving yourself and being confident in yourself, regardless of how your books do or if they ever get published or what the reviews say or what the readers say, um, is really important and really healthy. Very, very good advice. That's excellent. Okay. Are there any groups, clubs, or organizations that you'd recommend to other writers that may have helped you in your career? Oh, I think one of the biggest uh, influences on my writing uh, career has been uh, a group called Madcap Retreats, um, which is a, uh, uh, a series of writing retreats. Uh, I first became aware of it because they partnered with We Need Diverse Books, which is another organization that people should be yes. aware of, uh, promoting equity and and diversity and inclusion in children's literature. Um, but there was a, a Madcap Retreats and and We Need Diverse Books partnered to put on a workshop called Writing Cross Culturally, uh, which I went to and made a bunch of friends there, uh, met a bunch of authors that were much further along in their careers than I am, and and it was a really great place to be amongst other writers, have really meaningful conversations with them, and just get to know a bunch of people that in the future, if I had a situation could have come up in my life or in my writing, I'd be like, oh, you know, so-and-so said that happened to them once. I wonder if they have advice on this. Or, oh, so-and-so talked about how much this sucked and now it happened to me. I can be like, haha, I get it now. Um, just like the the amount of of generosity and knowledge in that space has really, really helped me. Great. And I, have, I have tried to pay for it as best I can. Okay. Now I have questions about you as a person. What is okay. one thing, this is one thing that most people don't realize about you? I don't know. I feel like you have to ask other people that, not me. <laughs> That's um, a good answer. I like that one. Yeah, I don't know. I have to think about that. I'll have to come back to that. Okay. I, don't know. I feel my. I feel like for the most part, I'm a pretty open book. Okay. I, this this one is a hard one, so you okay. might not have an answer for this one either. <laughs> um, what question do you wish other uh, do you wish interviewers would ask you, and what would your answer be? Oh. I wish interviewers ask me about what's bringing me joy more. I feel like, I don't know, I feel like a lot of us, especially in the last few years since the pandemic, um, have lost connection with like what brings us joy. And so I wish more people asked me about what was bringing me joy. And I wish I got to ask more people about what is bringing them joy. Uh, and what's bringing me joy right now uh, is that it's summer and I can go uh, eat al fresco and, and have a nice glass of wine and like a pizza or some pasta and and talk with friends that's bringing me a lot of joy right now how about what's bringing you joy right now i'm going to turn it on you oh it's the same thing exactly i um, mean since the pandemic things have totally changed i i have to admit uh, it used to be so much more social people used to always get together with friends and things like that and now it's 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 totally different for some weird reason, I don't know what it is, and um, yeah, I agree. I getting de getting together with friends and sitting down and talking and and just you know, world peace. <laughs> That's another thing. <laughs> well, if we could get that, that would definitely bring me some joy. Yeah, that would be bring me real joy. <laughs> so okay. Um, my next question, what is or are your passions when you're not working and how do you make time for the things that you love? Um, my passions are, uh, I love playing my guitar. Now you can see one of my guitars behind me. Um, I take guitar lessons every week. Uh, I love figure skating though. Um, uh, my coach has been having some, uh, some health problems in her family. Thankfully she herself is fine, but like going through some family stuff. So I haven't had a haven't been figure skating lately, but we'll eventually get back to that. Um, I do, in fact, love tea as well. I love cooking. Um, I love board games. And 
uh, and I think as with anything interesting, like if uh, anything important, like if it's important, you make time for it. And so unless I'm under a particularly onerous deadline, I tend to write Monday through Friday, like, and always be done by 5 p.m. And uh, so I can have dinner and then like have the evening to myself to to do what I want to see my friends, to go for Taco Tuesdays, to play my guitar. And um, I think part of that comes from what I was talking about earlier about like not not conflating my sense of self with my sense as a as a writer, um, because I get to have a life outside of my writing and outside of my books, and having that life will make my books better. Mm -hmm. So do you have a regular set schedule for your writing? Uh, for the most part, yeah. Um, I usually write, I kind of tend to do like the business of being a writer, like, you know, answering emails, doing promotion, that kind of stuff, um, like in the mornings. And then from about noon or 1 p.m. until about 5 p.m., Monday through Friday is when I like I'm actually writing or revising or kind of whatever my active project is. Okay, great. So um, what does your writing space look like? And what do you need to have around you when, when you're writing, like food, drink? Well, I'm actually in my writing space right now. This is my home office. Um, you can't really see my desk because my computer is on my desk. Um, <laughs> but I have I have my mug of tea. Um, I have my fountain pen, uh, which I bought many, many years ago. Gosh, 12 years ago, 13 years ago. I don't even remember. Um, when I, when I like got a nice raise at my, at my old day job and I was like, felt like I had a big boy salary now. And so I went and got myself a big boy pen. Um, I'm actually, uh, you can't, again, because of where the computer is, you can't see it, but I'm actually on a like treadmill, um, like an under the desk treadmill, uh, which I don't use during interviews because otherwise I'm like this the entire time. Um, <laughs> and it can be very distracting and loud for people. Um, I have a fan because walking makes me my body temperature rise and therefore I need to be fanned to cool myself off. Uh, and I usually have some sort of music going. I have a playlist for most of my projects. What kind of music do you listen to while you're writing? I, it varies project by project. Um, when I was working on Darius the Great is Not Okay, I was mostly listening to Young the Giant. Um, on the other hand, the, the latest thing I wrote, I uh, found myself listening to a bunch of Linkin Park, uh, which I hadn't listened to in what, five, six years. I think ever since Chester Bennington died, I don't think I'd listen to any Linkin Park. And suddenly I was like, I should listen to Linkin Park again. And it fit really well with the story I was working on. Mm. So you you prefer music when you're writing rather than silence. Oh, yeah. I find silence unnerving if I'm trying to create. Huh. Interesting. A lot of people, you know, a lot of people listen to uh, instrumental music um, rather than rather than uh, music with lyric. Oh, interesting. I tend to like both. I think um, I tend to tune out lyrics to a certain extent while I'm work working, uh, or I'm sort of, you know, one corner of my brain is listening to the lyrics and like they're inspiring me to keep hmm. writing because they're hitting on some emotion that I'm trying to capture. Ah. Not I can see like that copying the lyrics, but like, you know, what's great about songs is that they make us feel things. And sometimes you need to feel things in order to write about that feeling. And so I find hmm. music really helpful in that way. Yeah, that's very true. Very true. Now, authors um, oftentimes have have furry or feathered or un or uh, otherwise non-human companions to help them through their work. And do you have any, and do they help or hinder you? I, first of all, I thought you were about to ask me if I was a furry and I was like, boy, we have, we've only known each other for an hour. I don't think we can get that deep. Um, not that there's anything wrong with being a furry. Are you so furry? I, I no, like, sorry. I was like, whoa, this interview just went off the rails. Oh, uh, I do not. Oh my gosh. I hope your listeners know what a furry is. Um, Sorry, and I also hope that didn't come across as making fun of furries in any way, but I was just like, whoa, this interview just what got different. Um, just shows you that I'm a little scattered because I've been writing a lot. And sometimes when you're writing a lot- Well, that's brain, a good thing. Your brain is just a little bit mushy, a little squishy. Um, but no, I do not have any pets. Um, 
or plants actually I have what I like to call a gray thumb which is that any plant that I look at for too long dies um <laughs> unless it's plastic in fact one time my sister asked me to look after her plants and gave me very detailed instructions um except it was an air plant um that she like kept separately from like the container for the air plant so that because it was an air plant where you had to like spritz it and then let it dry so it didn't mold and then put it back in its container. And um, the air plant was like had a sign that said, do not touch on the actual plant itself. Um, so I spent two weeks spritzing the plastic moss that was like part of the decorative container for the air plant while the real air plant died. Oh no. <laughs> she also like had me water her basil and it was like, trim is needed. And I was like, great, it's growing strong. I don't need to trim it. And she came back and the basil had flowered and flowering ruins the taste of basil. It tastes bitter and acrid. And she's like, why didn't you trim it? And I was like, it didn't need trimmed. It was growing. And she's like, you're supposed to trim it before it has flowers. And I was like, that should have been included on my notes. Um, of course. The basil survived, but the cilantro that was planted next to the basil died for no reason, as far as I can tell. I just walked it, went out there one day and it had just like fallen over into the dirt. And I was like, I just, I was like, you just can't put me in charge of plants anymore. <laughs> so yes, but um, I do have my collection of teas that keep me company. When I write. Okay. <laughs> okay. So I, I just have two more questions. Right. Where can people find your work aside from Annie's Bookstop of Worcester? And I have to put a plug in for Annie's. Um, you can you can get Adib's books at Annie's if you call us at 508-796-5613, or you can email us at orders at anniesbooksworcester.com. And where else can people find your books? But first, I think you should spell it Worcester uh, for anyone that doesn't live in Worcester, for whom it is, maybe the spelling will be surprising, because I was surprised when I heard you say it aloud just now. Okay, it's W-O-R-C-E-S-T-E-R. Okay, just like the sauce, except without a shot. Yes, right like Worcestershire, yes. Worcestershire, whatever. Yes, I know, right? Even yeah, who who knows how the British do things? Yeah. Um, <laughs> yes, uh, I'm I'm on the web at adibkoram.com, a d i b k h o r r a m, uh, and that has links to all of my social things, um, including uh, buy links to my books at various online retailers that I won't mention because they're, you know capitalist monstrosities that are probably monopolies and hopefully the department of justice will do something about that someday we'll see <laughs> uh, as well as in many other local indies including my local is indie in my local indies here in kansas city uh rainy day books and uh under the cover uh and bliss books and wine and the raven out in lawrence which is only like 40 minutes away uh kansas city is actually seeing uh, like uh a lot of really amazing indie bookstores actually there's a oh. new one that's owned by a teenager who was just like we need a bookstore uh, called Seven Stories. Yeah, we have lots of great bookstores in Kansas City, which is really exciting. Uh, That's so if you're great. not in Wooster and you are in Kansas City, shop local. Otherwise, <laughs> I think. Uh, great. Yes. Wow. Um, sorry, it's it's great. Really long -winded and I just got completely off track. But yes. No, that's wonderful. Books, support your local independent bookstore. That's why my shirt says books. Great. And my last question is, how can we follow your work and share your awesomeness? Um. I mean, awesomeness is perhaps an overly generous description of my uh, posting photos of the pasta I eat, but <laughs> pasta is delicious. Um, but yeah, I'm on Instagram at Adib Koram, and I'm on Blue Sky at Adib Koram, and I am on TikTok at Adib.Koram. Even though there's not an Adib Koram without a dot, TikTok wouldn't let me use that username, and I can't figure out why, but it bothers me because I've been Adib Koram everywhere else because there's not a whole lot of other Adib Korams out there to fight for my username. Um, also, I have a monthly newsletter. Uh, if you go to adibkoram.com slash newsletter, you can sign up. I only send it once a month, uh, except for like special occasions like a book release. Um, it's usually pretty short and has like a funny picture and then like a funny animated GIF and then like a little essay about whatever I'm thinking about at the time, as well as links to whatever events I have coming up. Wonderful. Well, thanks so much. This has been a lot of fun. Um, it's been and, a delight for me too. Thank you so much for all your great and thoughtful questions. Oh, you're welcome. Thanks for, for joining me. And uh, we will be, uh, well, hopefully, uh, if you ever get to the Boston area or Worcester, W-O-R-C-E-S-T-E-R <laughs> area, <laughs> maybe you will come, come through again soon and I will make sure to stop at Annie's. Great. Thank you very much. Adib Karam. Right. Thank you. <laughs>